and welcome to Beauty is Eternal, in-depth interviews with experts that inspire. Today's episode is called Bioenergetic Expert Dr. Bradley Nelson, DC, Wisdom from the Emotion Code. Did you know that emotionally charged events from the past can remain in your body as trapped emotions and cause a multitude of problems in your health and in your life. Dr. Bradley Nelson is a world-leading expert in the fields of bioenergetic medicine and energy psychology, as well as a holistic chiropractic physician and the creator of the Emotion Code. He has given lectures on natural healing around the world, while his book and teachings have changed the lives of millions of people. Dr. Bradley graduated from Life Chiropractic College West in San Lorenzo, California in 1988 and was in private chiropractic practice until 2004 where he successfully treated patients who were suffering from things such as chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, and a wide variety of other ailments. Today, he and I are discussing his teachings from the Emotion Code, where he artfully explains the inner workings of the subconscious mind. Once I began reading the Emotion Code, I literally could not put it down, and I used it to release some of my own trapped emotions, which I will talk about during the show. I hope that this inspires some of you who are listening to try it as well. You can access Dr. Bradley's teachings 24-7 at discoverhealing.com, which includes emotion code seminar instructional videos, webinars, television and radio interviews, books, certification materials, and more. You can also find a practitioner in 80 countries, to help you release trapped emotions. You can also find Dr. Bradley on Facebook under Dr. Bradley Nelson or Discover Healing. Dr. Bradley is married and has seven children together with his wife, Jean. He lives with his family in Southern Utah from where I'm connecting to him for this interview. As Dr. Bradley himself says, At any moment, we have these diverging futures before us, and the choices that we make choose which path into the future that we take. Emotional baggage puts pressure on us to make choices that we would not otherwise make. Think about that for a second. That's a very profound quote by Dr. Bradley and gets to the heart of the interview that you are about to listen to. So... I hope you like it. Well, thank you for being a guest on the show, Dr. Bradley. Well, you're so welcome. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for having me on. I, it's, it's really great to be here, and uh, I'm excited to be able to talk to your audience, your followers. So you can ask me anything you want. <laughs> <laughs> well, I loved reading your book, so I think I have so much respect for you, so I'm a little bit nervous, but I'm really excited to have the chance to talk to you and learn more and get inside the brilliant mind. So. Oh gosh! Well, <laughs> thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> Sometimes I'm embarrassing when I'm nervous. So. <laughs> so your expertise is the human body and emotions, among other things. What are trapped emotions and why are they so important? Well, you know, doctors and prominent scientists for many years have said that the future of healing is energy, that the future of medicine is energy medicine. And why have they been saying that? The reason why they've been saying that is because uh, over 100 years ago, uh, physicists started to discover that uh, our bodies are really not what they seem to be. These bodies of ours seem to be very three-dimensional and very solid, and and they are, but they're also not. Uh, These bodies are really made of energy. So 
for example, if you look at your hand, your hand seems solid, but if you were to magnify your hand with a big enough microscope, eventually you'd be looking face to face with a single individual atom. And if you could look inside the atom, you'd see there's really nothing in there. It's just empty space. It's really just energy. There's a lot of empty space inside these bodies, even though they seem so solid and so 3D and they have weight and so on. But the strange thing is, uh, these bodies of ours are about 99.9999999999% empty space. And in fact, some physicists uh, recently made a publication or an announcement. They said, if you could take all the empty space, they see the quantum physicists have been trying to get everybody to understand this uh, for a long time. And so recently some quantum physicists came out and they said, look, if you could take all the empty space out of everyone's body, everyone on earth, you could fit all 7 billion of us into a box the size of a sugar cube. It would be very crowded, but, and it would weigh as much as all those bodies weigh. It's very bizarre. It's hard for us to get our minds around these concepts, but nevertheless, this is the reality that we live in. And we're living now in the 21st century, so we're starting to realize these things and, um, and realize them on a, uh, uh, on a more intellectual level, these things are being brought home to us where we've been able to kind of ignore these ideas for a long time. But now the reality of quantum physics is, is coming home. So what emotional baggage is or trapped emotions, uh, to, to help you understand this, what happened with me was I was in this practice. I went to school, became a chiropractor and, uh, I was always really driven to get to the underlying causes of my patients' problems. I didn't want to band-aid people. Um, I didn't want to give people temporary fixes. I really wanted to fix them completely, you know, if possible. And so I was kind of obsessed really with this idea of getting to the underlying causes of what was really creating people's symptoms. And so, um, Sometimes, for example, I'd have uh, someone would come in to see me and I would, I would realign a bone and it would go out of alignment again and I'd have to work on them again the next week. And that, that kind of drove me wild. I would think, well, why, why doesn't this stay put? You know, why do I have to keep doing this? Why can't I just fix people? And so uh, through, through a series of circumstances, eventually what I began to understand was that people had emotional baggage they had emotional energies that were trapped in their bodies. Now, to understand this, uh, what happens to us when we're going through an intense emotional experience? On a quantum level, we're feeling a certain emotion. Uh, all emotions are really vibrations. They're all frequency. And every emotion is a different frequency. So, for example, if you're feeling an emotion of anger, that's a different frequency. That's a different frequency or a different vibration than an emotion of grief. And that's different from um, frustration. They're all different. And what happens on a quantum level is that when you're feeling that intense emotion, uh, on that quantum level, what's going on is that you're feeling the emotion as a frequency, as a vibration. And so really everything is frequency everything is vibration and so when you're feeling an intense emotion your whole being now can be vibrating at this new rate this new level of vibration maybe it's anger or whatever and sometimes that emotional vibration is just too much for us to process and so when that event is over when the bully moves away or the divorce is finalized or you quit that job and get a better job, yet you're carrying with you some emotional energy that is trapped in the body sometimes from that emotion that you experienced maybe 10, 20, 30, 50 years ago, whatever. So to give you an example of how this can work, there was a, um, um, a man that came in to see me many years ago. He had really severe low back pain. It was a nine on a zero to 10 scale. He was really hurting and, um, I started working with him and I found right away that he had a trapped emotion. The emotion was anger. And I released the emotion and this probably took about a minute, honestly, to find and release this. And that's how fast the emotion code is. And uh, when I released that emotional energy from his body, 
the pain in his back went from a nine to a zero just instantly. And he was amazed and astounded and couldn't believe it. And it was like a miracle for him. And he kept walking around and bending over and exclaiming. And uh, I was grateful that it worked so well. So what was going on there? Now, there are really two parts to this. First of all, 20 years before, he remembered actually what had happened. Uh, it was a work situation. He was very upset, very angry about something. He'd been really unjustly treated, he felt. And that emotion of anger was so powerful, he couldn't process it. Some of that energy got stuck in his body. It's a ball of energy, literally. We believe these are from about the size of a baseball to about the size of a, of a small melon. And what these things do is they distort the normal energy field of the body. You know, when you distort the normal energy field of the body on a continual basis, you're ultimately distorting the tissues of the body themselves, right? And because that's all the body is, is an energy field, when you distort, when that trapped emotional energy distorts that energy field of the body, it's distorting the body itself, it's interfering with chemical reactions in that sphere of energy, uh, it's interfering with blood flow, lymph flow probably to some degree, we don't know, um, but it's also interfering with the flow of energy in that area. And so one of the most common side effects of trapped emotions is actually this kind of physical discomfort, okay? Like this guy had excruciating back trouble. So it was instantly gone because when you release a trapped emotion, suddenly that distorting force that that emotion is exerting on that area of tissue is, it's gone. And these are gone instantly. They don't come back. Kind of like if you take a credit card out of your wallet and it has a magnetic strip uh, with in information encoded on that strip, if you rub a magnet on that, that information is gone. It's not coming back. That's kind of how the emotion code works. The interesting thing about this, though, is that this guy came back into me a couple of days later. And he said to me, you know, he said, my back is still fine. I can't believe it. It's like a miracle. But he said, I have to tell you something. He said, when I came in here, I had another problem I didn't tell you about. He said, for as long as I can remember, I've basically been what you'd call a rageaholic. He said, I'm always yelling at my wife and my kids. I've got to watch the road rage. I've been to anger management several times. It hasn't really helped me. But since you released that trapped emotion of anger for me, he said, I feel really different. I just feel really relaxed. He said, I feel peaceful. Things don't set me off anymore like they used to. And he said, how did that work? And I said, I don't know. Because <laughs> I didn't know. I had no idea. But think about this, okay? Here's what we believe about these trapped emotions. This guy, think about this. 20 years before, he was in this argument, really upset, really angry. That emotional energy, his whole being was vibrating with this frequency of anger. It was too much. So some of that energy got trapped in his body. It was like a ball and it was in his low back. So literally a ball of anger in his low back. So 20 years later, he's, he's got so much discomfort in his low back, he's, his next step is surgery, right? But he comes in to see me and we release it. Comes back a couple days later, he feels like he's a different person. What was going on was, you see, that trapped emotion was exerting that distorting force, creating the physical discomfort, but also what was happening, Caitlin, is that he was, he was much more likely to feel the emotion of anger when he had that ball of anger in his back because literally part of his body was feeling that emotion 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So when he would fall into a situation where he might tend to feel that emotion of anger, you know, someone cuts him off in traffic or whatever might happen, he would fall right into that emotion much more easily, much more readily than he otherwise would have because literally part of his body was feeling that emotion 24 seven. This is how this works. It's the craziest thing. Now, if you think about your own life, think about all the intense emotional experiences that you've been through. We've all been through them, right? Maybe you cried yourself to sleep at night when you were a kid. Maybe your parents used to argue. Maybe your parents went through a divorce. Maybe you had breakups in junior high that were traumatic or high school, or maybe you've been through a divorce or who knows, maybe someone close to you has passed away or committed suicide or who knows what. We've all been through the gamut, right, of all these different things. The problem is we, 
carry so much of this, uh, this baggage, we carry these things with us, we think we leave things behind, right? But we carry these things with us. There was another, uh, uh, another interesting example that I saw many years ago. There was a woman who came in to see me who thought she was having a heart attack. She had crushing chest pain, I mean, difficulty breathing. The left side of her face was completely numb. Her left arm was completely numb. And that looks like a heart attack, right? And I told my staff, hey, we might need an ambulance. Luckily, we were right next to a medical center. And uh, so I did some testing on her really quickly and found she had a trapped emotion. And using the emotion code, I was able to figure out that this had occurred about three years before. And again, this probably just took less than a minute to find this, right? And uh, the emotion was grief from three years before. And when I found that, all of a sudden she burst into tears and she said, I can't believe that that's affecting me. I thought I dealt with all that. And she's weeping, right? And I said, well, what happened to you? And she said that three years before, her husband had been having an affair and she found out about it and confronted him about it. And their marriage blew up and she was really deeply in love with this guy and was planning on being with him forever. But this was the end of it, right? Suddenly it was all, her world was upside down and she cried for months over this, went to therapy, spent a year in therapy dealing with it mentally and that's great, but the emotional baggage was still there. She had even gotten remarried. And so as far as she was concerned, that ex-husband was just her ex and it was all over and behind her, but it wasn't behind her because that trapped emotion of grief was stuck right here in her heart, right where she'd been feeling it, see? Uh, and so when I released that trapped emotion, all of a sudden the feeling came back into her face and into her arm within about one second, just whoosh. And the chest pain was gone. The difficulty breathing was gone. It was all gone. And uh, she left the office about 10 minutes later feeling totally fine. And I remember after she left, I sat down at my desk and my head was spinning. And I thought, what in the world did I just see? How is it possible that a trapped emotion could exert that kind of force, could create those kinds of symptoms? Now think about this. That woman, I'm still in touch with, that was almost 30 years ago now. And she's doing fine. But I'll tell you something, I believe that she would have been, uh, she would have become a statistic, I think. If we had not found and released that trapped emotion from her divorce, I think she would have had a heart attack. She had all the symptoms of it that day. I think she would have died, literally, of a broken heart, which now we know is a true thing. Uh, the Japanese discovered it. They call it Takatsubo syndrome. In the U.S., we call it cardiac syndrome. We now know. Western medicine now admits people die of broken hearts. I think that's what would have happened to her. And no one would have known at the funeral and the aftermath. Nobody would have really understood that it was her husband's affair that really would have been what killed her. See, but we were able to, I believe, prevent that. So. Well, how many people have lived and then died of things like broken hearts and nobody really understood the root cause of it was a trapped emotion? Probably millions and millions. Probably, yes. Probably millions. I mean, we just, we have no idea. But, um, but the reality of it is now we have this simple way to find and remove this emotional baggage. And, um, and it really, it's so simple that anyone can do it. In fact, um, we, uh, uh, we, we had a story that came to us of a woman who, uh, who told us that she, she got the emotion code book and the book on audio and she started reading it and listening to it. And her son started reading it and listening to it. And uh, he started practicing with his friends and his mom didn't pay too much attention. And a couple of weeks went by. And then um, one day she gets a phone call and uh, the caller identifies herself as the mother of one of her son's friends. And she says, listen, my son has had a severe phobia of water all of his life. And we've tried everything to fix it. Nothing has ever worked. We've taken him to everybody. She said, we, we gave up some time ago thinking that he was ever going to get over this. It's been very disruptive to his life and to our life as a family. But she said that was something we were just living with and we were resigned to that. But she said, now I, I need to tell you, she said, I'm at the community pool. She said, my son is out playing in the water with the other boys 
for the very first time in his entire life, she said, your son did this. Your son did this to him. She said, I am just stunned. I can't understand how this is happening. What in the world is your son doing? Those two boys are only 11 years old. See, that's how easy the emotion code can be and yet how life changing it can be because emotional baggage is real. And it's an epidemic really in our society uh, in, you know, worldwide. It's, it's a fact of life as human beings that we trap emotional energies from these events that we go through and then those emotional energies disable us in some ways. They interfere with our ability to really manifest the most perfect, beautiful life that we can create in this world because we're dragging all of this baggage behind us. And the thing is, some of that baggage that we're dragging, uh, we don't even remember those events. Some of them happened when we were tiny babies or when we were toddlers or in the womb. And sometimes we inherit emotional baggage from mom or dad from the things that they went through. And sometimes they inherited that from their mom or dad. And sometimes these inherited emotional energies can go back for many generations. And yet, we now, in our lives, are being interfered with. Our lives are being hampered and disabled by that baggage. And again, some of it is from our own lives and some of it is not. But the emotion code makes it easy to find that, that baggage wherever and whenever it, uh, it was incurred. <laughs> <laughs> when you're talking, I've kind of been visualizing it like, as a person, you're an energy system moving and then something happens and you don't express it. So you hold on to this and then something happens and you hold on to this. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, you're kind of walking around with like this extra baggage in your energy field. And you don't know why you feel this or why whenever this happens, you act like this. You don't understand it. And you can go to therapy and you can talk it through and you can cognitively think you understand it. But the body might not understand it. Like the right. mind might be like, oh, sure, I'm, I've dealt with that experience. But the body might be like, no, you didn't. It's still right here. Yeah, that's exactly how it works. And so, uh, so you know, the traditional kinds of therapy are all great. And they do help us to deal with it on a, on a cognitive, on a, on a mental level. But they don't release the emotional baggage. That's a different thing. So uh, sometimes people find that just by releasing that trapped emotional energy, uh, their life changes and, and things are great. Sometimes people need to release the emotional baggage and then also do the more traditional kinds of therapy to deal with on a mental level too. But, um, but the beautiful thing about the emotion code is that anyone can learn it. Anyone can do it. And, uh, like the two 11 year old boys that the one boy was able to help his friend, uh, just by releasing that baggage. It's so simple. You see, that uh, it opens the door for lots and lots of healing. And there's lots and lots of healing that needs to take place in this world for the world really to continue and, and complete its transformation process that is it kind of in the middle of now or is beginning. <laughs> <laughs> That's very true. And it's simple enough that I was able to practice it on myself in a couple of willing friends, one of whom encountered an inherited emotion, actually. I was shocked that just her and I together were sitting there and we were able to discover she'd inherited anger from her mm. mother, actually. Yeah, interesting. Well, you know, I think that everybody has some inherited emotional uh, energy. And the thing about it is, you know, what's so fascinating is that this age that we're living in now, uh, science is now catching up with some of these ideas. In fact, scientists now are finding that Yes, it's true. They don't know how it works. But uh, if an animal has something traumatic that happens to it, it will somehow pass down the memory of that to its offspring. Science has no idea how this is done. But for example, if you put a rat into a maze and at a certain point in the maze, it uh, has something terrifying that happens or is injured or shocked or something, uh, even if it never sees the maze again, the offspring of that rat, when they get to that point in the maze, they'll stop dead in their tracks and look around because somehow they know that something happened there that was dangerous. And so this is how animals and also human beings um, 
ensure they help to ensure the survival of their posterity, right? So think about this. Here's the reality of how this works. Let's say that your great 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 grandfather went through some kind of a financial reversal and experienced maybe he went through bankers, maybe he was put into debtor's prison, which is something they had back then. Um, and maybe the emotion of grief about money was so powerful then that that was passed to his son and that it was passed to his son and his son and his son. And eventually now you have that. And now you wonder why you have such a hard time making money. And it all goes back to that great, great, great grandfather of yours and what happened to him, you see. And so it's not just about money. It's about all kinds of things. Let's say that your great, 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 great grandmother uh, was jilted at the altar and experienced this tremendous sadness and, and a feelings of abandonment and betrayal, right? About what? About relationships, right? And so now you wonder why you're alone and why you're having a hard time with relationships. And this can be the reason. What happened? Just like the rat passes down its memories of the maze, our ancestors passed down these, uh, these emotional energies, you see, uh, to try to help us, to try to protect us. And in other words, it's, it's almost like the great, great grandfather is saying, be careful about money because I had to go to debtor's prison because of money. And this, this eighth great grandmother is saying to you in a sense, be careful about relationships because I was betrayed. I was jilted at the altar. So be careful. So what it does is it creates in the subconscious mind this kind of wariness about certain things. And it can even lead to the creation of what we call idea allergies, which is where you can, you can reject the idea of relationships or money, or whatever it is on a subconscious level. It's really fascinating, but um, it's one of the most powerful aspects of this work that we do. Because you see, um, it's not just about the emotions that we've experienced ourselves. It's about, it's about emotional baggage that other people experienced and that now we're kind of the vessels for. But it's easy to find and remove those emotional energies. And, you know, with the emotion code, it's easy. <laughs> well, so one of the things you talk about in your book that I find really interesting is that an emotion can get trapped in one place when you have an experience, but it doesn't necessarily lodge in that same place. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, well, basically what happens is the organs and some of the glands in the body are frequency generators. And so they, they generate the energetic frequency, the vibrational frequency of the emotion. So for example, uh, the liver generates various emotions. The, the prime one there is anger, right? So uh, this is the reason we think why people, there are a lot of people in, in jail right now, in prison, because they were doing something, they were overstimulating their liver. When you overstimulate any organ, it will tend to produce more of those frequencies the, uh, if you overstimulate the liver, it may start to produce that emotional vibration that we recognize as anger. And this is the reason why, for example, uh, the, um, the angry drunk is a proverb, right? Well, he's okay unless he drinks, then he gets really angry. You know, we all have heard of people like that. There are a lot of people like that that are in jail because they did bad things when they were drunk, right? Um, so it's, it's an interesting thing. And, and of course, all the organs produce, uh, like I said, uh, all the organs and some of the some of the glands produce these emotions. So, for example, fear is connected to the kidneys. Okay, um, the lungs, grief and sadness and so on. And so, uh, so what happens is if you overstimulate an organ, it will tend to produce that frequency. Now, when you when a trapped emotion is created, it may lodge anywhere in the body. And sometimes, for example, Caitlin, have you ever had a situation where you were feeling a really intense emotion and suddenly maybe you had a twinge of pain somewhere? You ever had that happen? I think so. 
Yeah, I think most of us have had that happen at one point or another. I think that may be the creation of a trapped emotion. Uh -huh. Generally, we don't know when they get created, but I think that might be a little indicator because uh, I've had that happen too. So trapped emotions are invisible. You can't see them. Generally speaking, they will tend to stay where they lodge initially. And oftentimes they will lodge in an area where there is some kind of a metaphysical or symbolic relationship. For example, um, if you are experiencing an intense emotion about a relationship, uh, then it may, the emotion may lodge in the breast, for example, especially if you're a woman, could lodge in the sex organs. Uh, for example, I had a patient that came to me, she was, I think, 72 years old. And uh, the very first thing that showed up on her was she had a trapped emotion. The emotion was uh, sadness, actually, and it dated back to 1963. And it only took a minute or two to figure this out. And I thought to myself, gee, I wonder if that was about John F. Kennedy's assassination, because, you know, that's, that was a big event in 63. And uh, when I tested her, at the same moment that I'm verbalizing this, and getting a strong muscle response from her body, her subconscious mind, in other words, saying, yes, that's what this is about. At the same moment, she's breaking down, weeping. And she says, yes, that affected me so deeply. And then when JFK Jr. died in the plane crash, she said it was like it all came back all over again. All I could do for days was cry. I couldn't work or anything. Well, when you have a trapped emotion, you see, you'll tend to feel an exaggerated emotional response like she did. It was the death of another JFK and it was just too much to bear. So then I wanted to know where is this emotional energy, this ball of sadness, where has this been all these years? And you can figure this out. So I just did some testing and asked, well, was, was this on the right side of your body? No, it was on the left side of your body. It was in the area of the left breast. Well, coincidentally, she'd had that breast removed four years before. And so, you see, the thing is, what we believe uh, and our premise is uh, and our finding is that every disease process that human beings suffer from has an emotional component. And that shouldn't really surprise us much. I mean, that should really kind of ring true to us because it's a true principle. It's, it's, it's the truth. And so... The emotion code is simply a way to find and remove that emotional baggage. Now think about, uh, think about how many people there are in the world and think about how many tears they've cried and how many difficult situations they've been through. Think about your own life. Think about what you've been through. You know, life is a mixed bag, right? Uh, we have good days, we have bad days. And life, I believe, is all about learning to make good choices so that we experience better things and so we can continue to ascend right and become beings of higher vibrational levels and we learn to love unconditionally and so on but our emotional baggage really puts a drag on our ability to ascend and our and, and on our ability to love unconditionally see because we have all of these these subtle subconscious warnings going on well look out for money or look out for relationships and be careful and, you know, don't step out of your comfort zone much because you'll get slammed. And so we have all of that impetus coming from the subconscious, you see. And um, the beauty of it is that we can cut ourselves loose from this baggage. You can find a practitioner that can help you. We've got um, almost 6,000 emotion code practitioners now in 80 countries around the world. And most of them work um, at a distance. And so, because this is energy, energy medicine, really, I believe the simplest, purest form of it, really, you can find somebody that can work with you. It doesn't matter where they are in the world. You might find that, that, uh, the person that you love to work with the most that can, that can really help you and really gets you, maybe they're in Singapore or maybe they're in the UK or somewhere else, who knows? Um, but that's a beautiful thing. And, What's really nice is that you can learn how to do this yourself, just like you have, right? And you've been working with your friends. And it's, let me tell you something. Well, you may already be finding this is kind of addictive, right? When you find out that you're able to help yeah. people in this simple way. Is I'm that right? I'm asking everybody, can I clear some <laughs> emotions for you? Want to try it? <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah, that's so fun. Well, it, it's addicting. And I'll tell you something. It's life-changing when you start to do this for yourself and you feel the changes and for other people. 
and your life will change. The first time that you do that, maybe you've done this already, but the first time that you do this with somebody that's far away, maybe you're on the phone or on Skype or something, and maybe they're on the other side of the planet or in another country, and you make a change that brings them a significant difference in how they're feeling immediately while you're still talking, your life will change again in that moment because you'll realize, wow, Dr. Nelson isn't making this up. This actually is real and it works. It's, it's a very practical application, really, of quantum physics because um, we're all connected and these principles in quantum physics that are really so hard to understand and that seem so bizarre to us, like quantum entanglement and action at a distance and all of these things, it's actually really, really simple. And that's why this little 11-year-old boy could work on his friend and fix his water phobia. It's, uh, that's the beautiful thing about it is it's just so simple. And, you know, the... Um, I think a lot of the reason for the simplicity of this is because this came about, you see, during all these years that I was in practice and I was really obsessed with fixing people and getting to the underlying roots of their problem. And I was really desperate to figure out what these causes were. And I loved it and I loved what I was doing. And, and you know, the old saying is if you love something enough, it will give up its secrets to you. And that's what happened with me. And I was also uh, in this habit of asking for help. I learned at a very young age, there's a higher power that we can draw upon. And I think most people go through their lives and they, they never, they never ask for help from up above, from that being that, you know, you might call God or father or whatever source energy, whatever you might call it. But, um, I've learned that that higher power is definitely aware of us all the time. And if we ask for help, then it enables that help to come to us. It opens that channel. And so when I was in practice, I had this habit of just silently asking, just I had a momentary pause that I would make just before I'd work on somebody. And nobody ever knew that I was asking for help. I was praying for them. But I would just take a moment and just say, Father, please help me to help this person uh, and uh, in the name of Jesus Christ. And then that was it. And I was able to help them. And there were times, I'll tell you, Caitlin, when I would offer that silent prayer for help, the information that I needed sometimes would just flood into my being like an avalanche of understanding. It's the most amazing thing. That only happened a few times in all those years. And uh, the rest of the time, I think when we're asking for help like that, uh, it doesn't have to be a long, elaborate thing. It's just asking silently. It doesn't have to be verbal or anything. Usually those answers, I think answers always come, and they usually are missed because they usually come in the form of a, a little thought or a little impression or a little idea. And it's that voice coming from above to us is usually so subtle that we miss it. See, mm. but, um, right. But, but if we're asking for help, you know, then, uh, we, we open that channel. So that's, that really is where all of this healing work that I'm doing, that's where it's really come from. That's what's helped to solidify all this and make this so simple. And so my ego is not in it because the ego wants to make things more complicated, right? But my ego isn't in this because I, I'm just on a mission from up above, uh, from, you know, I just feel like I'm, uh, my whole life, everything that's happened to me in my life has prepared me to bring this healing work into the world at this time when the world really needs it. But it isn't about me. It's not about me at all. It's about everybody else. And I'm just the teacher here to show everyone what can happen and how we all have emotional baggage. And now we can get rid of it in this really simple, easy way. Right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> can you just give me one second? I just want to put the light on because it's getting so dark in here as the sun's oh. It's incredible to think that you could carry baggage, emotional baggage for 30 years. And then in one minute, you can actually release it. I think like for the human mind, it's like, but shouldn't it take me 30 years to release it? But actually, it doesn't it doesn't work like that. I want to ask you about the method of how you release it, like what, you know, the mechanics of what happens. But first, I want to ask you, um, how many trapped emotions does the average person have? Well, you know, it depends. When we work with children, for example, uh, for example, working on a two or three year old child, they might have five or six or eight or 10 trapped emotions. And that may be it. That might be all that they have. 
Um, but, you know, as you continue to live your life and you go to elementary school and maybe you go to junior high and high school, you have relationships and so on, we, we build up more layers. So the average person we think probably has somewhere around 350 trapped emotions. Oh my God, I need to, I need to do a lot more. <laughs> I've only released seven so far. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. And it's a process. And, um, and, and you know, sometimes uh, you can also prioritize. You, you, when you go to work with trapped emotions, you can ask your subconscious mind. You can just have an intention to release the most important trapped emotion that you can right now. And some are more important than others. And uh, so that's something that you can do that can help. Because sometimes when you release uh, one really important trapped emotion, it may trigger a spontaneous release of some other ones. Kind of like the, um, the principle of the, what's called the key log principle, where back in logging days, uh, when they were doing lots of logging in the United States, they would put these logs that they would cut down into the rivers. And sometimes there would be hundreds and sometimes thousands and thousands of logs in a river. And sometimes they would, they would create a log jam. And then they had these people who were, uh, I guess they called them key loggers. What they would do is they would look at the log jam and try to figure out of all these thousands of logs, what's the most important one to release? Because mm. one of them is kind of holding everything else up. So they would look for that key log and then remove that log and that could get everything else flowing. Sometimes these would go on for miles, these log jams. So um, that's an interesting principle. And sometimes if we find the most powerful uh, key trapped emotion, you, you can ask about that, have that intention, and that can help to speed up the process. That clarifies it. That makes sense. Because I was wondering when I was doing it, if I was releasing the most necessary one first or if it had to go in a certain order. And it sounds like if you have that intention, then you release yeah. it in the order of necessity. Yeah, you just have that intention and the subconscious mind is basically like Google. Okay, it's <laughs> a search engine, right? And, you know, it'll, it'll retrieve whatever it is you're looking for and it, it knows. <laughs> well... I know from reading your book, I was reading it and I was like, I want to know how to do it. I want to know how to do it. I was reading and turning the pages. I couldn't stop. I couldn't put it down. And I was like, I have to figure out how to do it. I'm guessing if somebody's listening right now and they've never heard of it and they're hearing about it, they're like, I want to know how to do it. I want to try it. <laughs> Could sure. you uh, walk somebody through the steps of how it works, like the technique you use to do it? Yes, absolutely. Well, there are... Um... There are a number of different methods of tapping into the subconscious mind. And to understand this, you see, we spend all of our waking hours in our conscious mind. And uh, when we go to sleep, the subconscious mind is still there. It never sleeps. Our conscious minds are only available part of the time. But the subconscious mind is always there. And it's the subconscious mind that is running your body. It's creating new red blood cells constantly, about 3 million new ones every minute or so. It's... Uh, it's keeping our heart beating and keeping the air going in and out of our lungs. And that subconscious mind knows what emotional baggage you have. And it knows uh, what that emotional baggage, what those trapped emotions are doing to you. So to find that emotional baggage, to find those trapped emotions, we have to tap into the subconscious mind. Now, there are a number of different ways of doing this, okay? And tapping into the subconscious mind, that might seem very esoteric, but in reality... We have some simple ways of doing it. One of the things that you can do is what we call the sway test. Now, a plant will naturally grow towards a light coming in from a window. Uh, it will grow away from darkness. Uh, plants will grow towards soothing music coming from a speaker. They'll grow away from harsh sounds. Uh, the human body has the same ability. And uh, if you're standing with your arms down by your sides and you're very relaxed, standing up straight, uh, if you ask questions and you allow your body time to answer those, the body will sway forward for yes and backward for no. So you can ask, do I have a trapped emotion? And as you're standing there relaxed, this technique is in the book, by the way, your body will tend to sway forward if the answer is yes. And this is one of the ways you can get answers. Now, there are other ways too. For example, uh, in the book, we teach a number of methods. Um, one of these is called the ring in ring test, probably the simplest one, where you make a ring in a ring. And uh, as you're asking questions of the subconscious mind, 
when you try to pull the rings apart, the rings will tend to stay together. You'll be a little stronger on a yes answer. You'll be a little weaker on a no answer. And so the subconscious can give you yeses and nos that way. So you ask questions. Do I have a trapped emotion? Well, if you get a strong answer, that's a yes. Then what you do is we have an emotion code chart. Now you can, you can find this chart. Uh, actually, the simplest thing probably is to go to um, emotioncodegift.com. That's emotioncodegift.com. And you can download these, uh, the flow charts of how to do this. And also you can download the chart itself. And the chart, uh, let me see if I've got one in my drawer here. I may or I may not. I guess I don't. Um, but the chart has 60 emotions in it divided into two columns and six rows. Now your subconscious mind, when you're looking for a trapped emotion, it already knows what the emotion is. If you ask, do I have a trapped emotion? The body will, if your body says yes, you get a yes answer. Your body sways forward or you get a strong muscle test. That's a yes. Then what you do is you look at that chart of emotions and you ask, is the emotion in column A or column B? If the emotion's in column A, for example, uh, then you look at the list of six rows and you'll ask, the next question is, is it in one of the odd rows or, you know, and if that's a no, then you know it's in an even row. And so that's how you figure out the cell that contains five emotions. Then at that point you'll ask, well, okay, it's in column B, row six. Is it pride or shame or shock or unworthy? Okay, it's unworthy. And then the next question is, one of those will be strong, in other words, usually. Uh, and that's the emotion. So that's how you can identify the emotion. Then the next question in the flow chart is, do we need to know any more about this emotion? In other words, sometimes the subconscious mind will want you to dig a little bit deeper about an emotion. It will want something brought to conscious awareness. For example, maybe the emotion wasn't really even your emotion. Or maybe it was not about your divorce, but maybe it was about... Uh, you know, the childhood uh, breakup you had when you were 12 years old, you know, and the subconscious might want you to know that. So you might have to identify when it occurred. Usually that's about all you'll have to identify is maybe when it happened. If you have to go further, you might have to identify the fact that maybe it wasn't your emotion that started with you. Maybe you absorbed it from someone else. So these are questions that you can find out. And again, most of the time you can find the release of trapped emotion in about a minute or, or so, okay? So if you're taken to a column in a row and the answer is no to all the emotions, then what you do is you ask, is this an inherited emotion? That's how usually the body takes us to inherited emotions. It'll take you as far as you can. It'll take you to the right column. It'll take you to the right row. But when you ask, well, is it grief or anger or frustration or depression, the subconscious mind will say, well, no, it's not exactly those. So those will all go weak. Then if you ask, well, was this inherited, you'll get a yes. And then uh, you can find out, well, did I get this from my mother or from my father? Oh, I got it from my father. Did he get it from somebody earlier? Oh, he did. Okay. And then you can kind of trace this back and see how many generations it goes back. And then you can release it. And what's really interesting, Caitlin, is that we find that when you release a trapped emotion that was inherited from someone, it releases not only from you, but also from them. And we've, we've actually proven this um, in live situations where, you know, a great grandmother was there, the, gr the, the, um, the grandmother, the mother, the daughter, you know, the granddaughter. And we were able to see that it definitely clears from all those generations. But that might it might go back 10 or 20 generations. And of course, a lot of those people might be passed on, but it still seems to release from them as well. So you can figure that out. <laughs> Give me something to think about. <laughs> Well, it's a very cool process, and when I tried it with myself and my friends, we did this sway test, all of us, and it takes a little while to get used to it because your body is kind of like moving a little bit, but once you get used to it, you can very clearly tell if your body is saying yes or no. Right. You, you, you get like a very strong sense of, okay, my body is moving a bit now. Okay, this is definitely an, an answer, and it's actually quite easy once once you get used to it. Yeah. At first, I was like do I really mean yes or do I really mean no? But then after a few tries, it's kind of, it's so cool. Yeah, it is really cool. And um, it's important to just um, just allow your body to, to talk to you and it will. Uh, your body wants to get rid of this emotional baggage and 
it's something that you can do and you can learn. So kudos to you for learning how to do it and helping your friends. Good job. <laughs> Thank you may you. even decide you want to become one of our certified practitioners at some point and and uh, and start helping other people around yeah, the world. Yeah, I thought about that. I was looking at that on your website that you offer trainings for that. Mm -hmm. yeah, so you sure. offer trainings for individuals in the emotions and in the body, right? Yes. Well, we have um, we have the emotion code. Uh, and we have an emotion code certification program for people who, who really want to master this and who then want to also be able to maybe do it for a living or to make some additional income. And, uh, and like I said, we have somewhere between five and 6,000 of those people uh, in about 80 countries around the world. We have another program um, uh, that's a self-study uh, course on energy healing. It's called The Body Code. And The Body Code was developed during the years that I was in practice um, trying to figure out what was really wrong with people. And I found that there are really six different kinds of imbalances that we all suffer from. Now, emotions that are trapped falls into one of those categories. But the other categories are the other kinds of things that can um, destroy our health and well-being. Things like um, pathogens that get into the body and set up housekeeping. Things like nutritional deficiencies or lifestyle issues, like not getting enough sleep or maybe having our pH off or whatever. Um, things like uh, toxicity in the body uh, or misalignments of things in the body uh, or imbalances in the circuitry and the systems of the body. All of that is, uh, is contained in this patented system that I created called the body code. So we offer certification in that as well. And um, uh, that's an app. Actually, it's software that's going to be coming out. Uh, it'll be a subscription that'll be available. We're hoping it's going to come out middle of March. Okay. And then um, you'll be able to actually use the subconscious mind again to ask about other issues that you might have going on besides trapped emotions. And your subconscious mind is aware of all of these things. And your subconscious mind would like for you to tune into it and ask what it is that uh, your subconscious really needs to be able to get well. Mm -hmm. so. It's it's a wonderful process. And in addition to being able to reach you on your website and find out more, your website is discoverhealing.com. That's the best place to go. I'm going to yeah. link to that in the notes. And you also use Facebook and Instagram under Dr. Bradley Nelson mm -hmm. and Discover Healing. You right. also have some live events coming up this year that you were talking to me before I started the recording. We do. Let's take a look here. We've got, um, well, if you go to discoverhealing.com and you go to the events tab, that's where I am, uh, you can see some of these things. Um, let's see here. We have an emotion code seminar coming up March 30th. Uh, the year is 2020. Um, that's in St. George, Utah. Uh, we have another one. We have a body code seminar coming up in Phoenix, Arizona. That's going to be March 27th. Uh, we have a, uh, I'll be speaking at the Heal Conference in uh, Esslingen in Germany. That's going to be on April 3rd, April 10th. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Suzanne Hufnagel teaching a seminar in, uh, in Switzerland, in, uh, in Basel. And uh, let's see. April, oh, actually, I'm going to be doing that one with her. Yes. Uh, we'll be doing uh, our very first seminar in India, in Delhi, on wow. Saturday, Saturday and Sunday. Yeah, April 25th and 26th. We're super excited about that. Uh, then, uh, let's see, April 29th, we'll be in, um, let's see here. I will be teaching in Frankfurt, Germany, uh, and then April 30th through May 2nd uh, on the body code. And then I'll be speaking at the Animal Energy World Conference in Manchester in the UK uh, on the 15th and 16th, 17th of May. Then we'll be back here for an emotion code seminar in Salt Lake City on May 16th. Um, and then uh, let's see here. I'll be teaching the emotion code and body code in London, uh, UK on the 23rd and 24th. And we'll be back here uh, for Spokane. We have a seminar going on on June 13th. Uh, Fort Lauderdale, a body code seminar on July 10th. And then I'll be speaking at the Gaia Sphere. Uh, mm -hmm. I'll be doing an emotion code seminar at the Gaia Sphere in Boulder, Colorado for Gaia. Uh, Gaia TV. So, um, and then there's more events wow. going on. That gives you an idea. <laughs> yeah, you're all over. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> Pretty fun. One mm -hmm. thing we didn't really get to talk about was the use of magnets. Can I ask you about that, or do you want to leave that yeah. part out? 
Okay. Well, no, that's fine. Yeah, magnets. Um, initially, uh, when I was trying to figure all of this out, magnets played a, an enormous role, and um, and they still do. Uh, you see, magnets are a form of energy, uh, or well, let me let me put it this way: magnetic energy is a form of energy, and magnets are pretty much ubiquitous. They're everywhere. Everybody has magnets. You can find a magnet in your house with no problem. Everyone's got one. And so you can use any kind of a magnet, uh, no matter how, how big or small, how strong or weak it is, to release emotional baggage. When you find a trapped emotion, you identify it. What you can do, if you're working with yourself, you can use a magnet. Or if you don't have a magnet, you can use your hand because it's also magnetic. And uh, you can just pass your hand like so over from your forehead to the back of your neck a few times. There's a meridian called the governing meridian. It's like a little river of energy. It starts at the tailbone and it runs straight up the back and over the top of the head and ends at the inside of the upper lip. And if you put uh, energy and intention into any length of that meridian, when you're at a point where the emotion is ready to be released, it's kind of like taking a credit card out of your wallet and swiping a that uh, magnetic strip with a magnet, it just erases that data. This is the same thing, see? So that's how you actually release a trapped emotion. If it's an inherited emotion, you do this 10 times, okay? Just takes a little bit more energy, a little more effort to release it because you know, there's more people involved than just you. So that's how that works. So uh, for me, if I have a magnet, I'll go ahead and use it. Uh, if I don't have a magnet, I'll just use my hand. And that's what we teach people now is that you can, Use a magnet, it's kind of optional, but magnets are great, so. Mm, that's amazing. <laughs> There's a, do you have to go or could I ask you one more question? Go ahead, yeah. Okay, so one of the things that when I was reading your book, I found really interesting, you mentioned that ancient cultures may have done this type of healing as well, but it had been lost to records perhaps. Do you believe that um, yeah, what type of healing do you think that our predecessors were using? Well, I think that um, there's really nothing new under the sun. I think that uh, I think we're living in a really amazing time when all of the knowledge that has ever existed is coming back to the earth, and things that maybe were never known before are also coming back to the earth. Um, so. It's hard to know about a lot of things, but you know, look at acupuncture, for example. There are acupuncture maps that have been unearthed that date back to uh, 3,000 years before the birth of Christ. I mean, wow. that's a long time ago, right? And those maps are the same maps that they use today. Well, if it didn't work, it wouldn't still be around. And I think that um, there's, there's a lot of knowledge, unfortunately, that I think has been lost to this world. Uh, I've met uh, I've met people and known people myself who were uh, who were older doctors who had learned some really amazing, fascinating things, and unfortunately, you know, in a couple of cases, they passed on and didn't really weren't able to really share that information. See, and so that's one of the things that I learned that I I wanted to make sure didn't happen, you know, for me, because um, and then I was really instructed as far as the body code goes. It was really one of those things where. You know, creating the emotion code, I knew it was really a message from up above that, you know, that I, I needed to get out of my own practice. I needed to write a book and take this to the world. And with the, the body code, it was even more specific. About a year after the emotion code came out, one morning I woke up and my mind was full of instruction. And I was literally told, you need to take everything that you've learned about natural healing and put it into a self-study course and make it available to everyone everywhere. And so that's what the body code actually is. It's, it's everything. The emotion code is included inside. It's in the body code. And um, so, again, the body code is going to be made available as a subscription app. And you can try it out for the first seven days for free and, you know, check it out and see how you like it and so on. It'll, and then eventually as the subscription will be about a dollar a day to have all of that healing knowledge available to you. So we're really excited about that. It's going to make it available to, uh, to lots of more impoverished countries around the world. So. Good stuff. I'm definitely going to try that out. You know, I've tried uh, quite a different, quite a few different methods of healing. And I wanted to mention that I actually do something called somatic experiencing therapy. And uh, 
a couple of weeks before I read your book, I was saying to my therapist that I was feeling like a ball of energy around my solar plexus. It was like yellow green and it was causing me a lot of stress. So I actually did your healings and to my great shock, I had to clear hatred and jealousy and they oh. came out as yellow and green and they were actually in this area. Yeah. And I, yeah, and I'm, I'm feeling better since then, but I'm not an angry per, I'm not a hateful person. And I'm not a jealous person, but I had experiences where those got trapped. So sometimes you might not think you have something or it might be an inherited emotion, but actually you, you do. And then I was having very vivid dreams the night after that. And I was remembering things that I'd forgotten and sort of repressed. And it was really fascinating to see, like, probably if you listen to this, you think, oh, this is probably what I have, or this is probably what I have. There are probably a couple I can guess, but I got something I definitely didn't expect, but it also yeah. did, did expect it because it explained the ball of energy that I was feeling just as you described it. So it was amazing. Yeah, good for you. Well, that's a really, really great point is that uh, you don't, when you're doing this work, you don't want to have any preconceived ideas or notions about what, what it might be because you really literally have no idea. You have no idea. And so it's important to just be kind of a blank slate and be open to whatever shows up without any judgment, right? But good for you. That's a perfect example. And when you're having the vivid dreaming, that sometimes is what we call processing, where when you release emotional baggage, usually you know for a day or two, uh, you'll be processing that. And sometimes you might even have some noticeable symptoms like the vivid dreaming. Sometimes people will cry easily or kind of be on edge for a day or so. That's normal. That's just your body kind of healing from, you know, the healing, the aftermath. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. I notice the dreams after every one that I do and I sort of start to remember stuff and I'm like, Oh, I totally forgot about that. <laughs> Yeah, so funny. that's an interesting thing. Sometimes, you know, when, when you're working with trapped emotions and you're releasing things, sometimes something will come up from a certain age and you won't have any memory of what might have happened. There's a lot that goes on in our lives that we don't remember, frankly. I mean, think about it. How much of your childhood do you remember? Well, just the highlights for most people, right? But yet uh, there were things that happened. Um, one of my favorites uh, was a woman who uh, I was working with long distance on the phone and it came up that she had a trapped emotion of grief and it was from uh, age 28 and she said well I, that doesn't make any sense everything was fine when i was 28 and i said well i can double check it and i double checked it and i said yeah definitely grief at 28 she said well doesn't make any sense and i said well you know these are accurate within a year give or take so you might have actually chronologically been 27 or maybe even 29 but you're probably 28 it's sometime around in that span she's and she just was saying it didn't make any sense and she couldn't remember anything. And I said, well, let me, let me check it a third time. And so I checked it a third time and I got the same answer. And I said, look, there's a lot that you don't remember. And so she says, well, it just doesn't make any sense. I, I don't remember anything that happened at that time. And then she breaks down crying and it all comes back to her and how she blocked oh, this out. I have oh no God. idea. Her husband had an affair when she was 28. Yeah, how she blocked this, I have no idea. She had an affair to get even, right? She was excommunicated from her religion, and her life started into this downward spiral of oh one-night stands and, and misery, and she had kind of just really pretty effectively blocked it off. But yet, you know, isn't That's that interesting? amazing. Yeah, and so sometimes things happen that we just we block or sometimes it, we just don't remember, you know, um, sometimes, sometimes we have things that happen where, for example, um, uh, I was working with someone once uh, when they were a child, it showed up that they had a trapped emotion that happened around age seven, I think it was, and there was no memory at all. Uh, and so we released the emotion and a couple of days later, uh, she contacted me and said, it all came back to her that she was, she was pushed off her bike and kicked and so on and kind of beaten a little bit by a group of other kids. And she'd kind of just forgotten about it because, you know, we're, we're built to survive, right? Caitlin, we're, we're built to survive. We're built to move on. And we think we put these things behind us and they're ancient history and they're not part of us anymore, but in so many cases they are still part of us. So getting rid of that baggage is such a nice way to, to really let the past go and begin our, 
ascension process, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and start and moving higher. Well, you reminded me of something. It might even be that you discount your own experience because somebody told you, why are you still upset about that? Yeah. Why are you crying about that? What's wrong with you? Stop crying. And you thought to yourself, okay, if I'm still about upset about something from two days ago or two weeks ago or two years ago, there's something wrong with me. Because other people told you that because there are a lot of people who are quite judgmental and they think, well, you should be over that now or you're yeah. too emotional. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> that too. Absolutely. Yeah, we, um, we don't like to, you know, we don't like to dwell on the past. And so we, we move ahead and we put things behind us. But, you know, um, some things we don't. Um, and we carry that emotional baggage with us. And so you can think of every, everybody that you know as dragging these suitcases behind them, yeah. right? And there's rocks in the suitcases, and maybe there's a steamer trunk that they're dragging from great-great-grandpa, <laughs> what he went through. And the emotion code is just this simple way to saw through those ropes and chains and cut yourself loose from <laughs> stuff. You don't need it. And they're keeping your vibration lower, right? They are, You yeah. have a lot they're of it. Yeah, it's like it, they're like sandbags on the balloon of your life, you know. Oh, and no. <laughs> the more you, the more you get rid of those, the faster you can run. Yeah. <laughs> well, you were talking about ascension, so that's actually a great metaphor. The last thing I want to ask you—I know you have to leave—is could you talk about this ascension, what it means for you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, um, I'll tell you what what I think it is about. Um, I think it's really ultimately about our ability to love unconditionally, not only ourselves, which sometimes is the hardest obstacle for us, right? To love ourselves unconditionally in spite of all of our mistakes that we've made and so on. But it's, a, it's about our ability to love others unconditionally too. I think that people are put into our lives and put into our path, um, to see how we'll react as a test for us, you know? Can we love someone who is of maybe a religion that we disagree with or that we don't like? Can we love someone unconditionally that is maybe a different shade of color than us or that has different sexual preferences than us or different political views than us? Can we love that person unconditionally? I'll tell you something. There was a, a fascinating uh, story that um, that I heard about where a, a man was a uh, uh, an emergency room physician. This is somewhere on YouTube. I'll, if I find this, I'll send it to you. Um, and he talked about how they don't really resuscitate or save a, a big percentage of people that come into them that have passed out or passed on that are flatlined that are dead. Most of them they can't, but sometimes they bring them back. There were three people, he had this experience where in his ER, there were three people that he was involved with resuscitating, bringing back from the dead. And all three of them said the same thing. They said, why did you bring me back? Why did you bring me back? They all said the same thing. They all said that for the first time in their existence, when they passed away and they went to the other side for the first time, they felt total acceptance. Total acceptance. Now, think about how profound this is. I believe, you see, that total acceptance is the fruit of unconditional love, see? If you really, truly love someone unconditionally, you totally accept them, don't you? You don't have all these reservations. You don't have all these agendas. You just accept them for where they are and what they are, right? Think about how beautiful that is, right? It's very we beautiful. can be that way. See, we have that capacity. We have that ability. And so getting rid of this emotional baggage and ascending to me is all tied up with our ability to love unconditionally. It's about, you know, and our ability to love unconditionally stems from the choices that we make too. The more good choices we make, the more we facilitate our ability to love unconditionally, right? If we make bad choices consistently, we're too busy dealing with the consequences of those bad choices to love unconditionally. But as we make good choices, our vibration gets higher and higher, and we find our, ourselves be, being more able to accept 
ourselves and others. And imagine living in a world where everyone is just completely in a state of acceptance of everybody else. In other words, having unconditional love for everyone. That We're going to go there. That's where we're going. That's the ultimate end result of all of this. We're going to get there. Trust me. It's going to take, you know, some effort, but we'll get there eventually. <laughs> that brings me a lot of joy and happiness to hear, Dr. Bradley. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it, it does to me, too, because it's, um, you know, even though the world is going through all these difficult, crazy things, you can think of the world as really kind of being in labor. You know, when a woman is in labor, that's it's a super bloody. It's messy. Place. It's painful. Yeah, painful, messy. It's horrible. My, I, I've been there. I've seen it with my Seven wife. Seven times. Yeah, exactly right. So um, the earth is in labor, and it's trying to bring forth this new world, this higher vibrational world that's all about unconditional love, see? And uh, yeah, it's going to be a challenge to get there because there are all these entrenched negative sorts of energy thought forms and patterns and things that are entrenched and they, they want to hold on to their power and they're hanging out with dear life, right? Mm -hmm. um, but they're not going to be able to, uh, to stop the transformation that's coming. And so the emotion code and really the body code too, they're, they're part of that. They're part of giving power back to the individual because we're all capable of healing. We're all healers. We just don't know it necessarily in most cases. So that power is being given back to people. And uh, that's the most beautiful thing I, I think of all, that um, people are learning that they have the ability to change their lives and the lives of those that they care about. Um, and now we're, you know, our business is just giving them those tools, right? And giving them that teaching, giving them that education so they can do it. So the world can transform, you know, one person at a time. Uh, so our, our, uh, our company, purpose is um, changing the world, healing the world really, by empowering you. Healing the world by empowering you. Uh, in other words, by empowering the individual. And that's what's going to change the world. It's going to come from, it's a grassroots thing. It's going to happen by individuals healing their neighbors and healing their loved ones and healing their families and so on. That's how it's going to happen. So those are my thoughts on that topic. <laughs> Well, on an energetic level, if you raise your vibration when you clear your trapped emotions and those of people around you, you do raise the vibration of the planet, actually. It's a collective That's right. effort. So That's, it, right. It, That's right. That's right, because we're all connected, now. right? You know, it's a fascinating thing. Um, when, we, when we release inherited emotional baggage, for example... What happens is it releases, like I said, not only from that person that's living and breathing, but also from those ancestors that it may go back 10 or 20 generations. It releases from all of them. And how many people might be able to trace that ancestry back to, uh, you know, a, a 20th great grandmother? Well, maybe thousands of people. And it releases from all of them as well. See, and um, so I, I think that uh, talking about inherited emotions, which we did a little bit. I think that this world is not going to be able to transform unless, uh, unless we bring them with us, see, because they're just as much a part of this world as we are. Ah, interesting. Right? And, um, and um, when I, the reason I go to these uh, animal energy world healing events, for example, is because the woman who created them was actually told, she heard a voice and she said, if you, uh, I can't, I'm going to have to paraphrase it, but it was basically, if you really want the world to heal and change, you have to bring the animals mm -hmm. along because mm -hmm. the world can't be saved without them. See, the world oh, can't heal without them. There's a lot of animal pain, so. Yeah. And so that's also part of the emotion code. We could do a whole nother event on that if you wanted to, but you know, <laughs> animals get trapped emotions too. And so we teach you, it's in, it's part of the emotion code book. It's a chapter in the book. And you can learn how to do this and heal them as well. So it's all good. It's all fun stuff. <laughs> well, it, I haven't tried the distance healing yet, but it's definitely one thing I want to try. Because once you try it out and then you realize everybody has trapped emotions and then you want to help everybody, mm -hmm. you know, it, it definitely, because if you free someone you care about from a trapped emotion, you could help prevent them from getting a serious disease. 
or having an accident that could take their life later because it's like energetically you're if you're you know going like this and you have all these trapped emotions in this baggage you're kind of going a little bit to the left and but if you don't have them and maybe you'd be going straight so things happen right. in your life that wouldn't happen if you're energetically in the right alignment i think so in theory oh, you totally can believe that, yeah. help everybody the way I look at it is, you know, at any moment we have these diverging futures before us and the choices that we make choose which path we take into the future, right? And uh, the thing about our emotional baggage is it puts pressure on us, this subtle kind of pressure to make choices that we might otherwise not make, right? Uh, for example, um, people who continually choose the wrong kind of mate right? Uh, women, for example, who continue to choose, you know, the abusive person that is going to hurt them. Why do they do that? They do that because of their emotional baggage, mm -hmm. right? Um, why do we, uh, why are we oftentimes unable to, to fall in love when oftentimes that's because of emotional baggage? Specifically, it's about emotional baggage in this case uh, that is clustered around the heart that we create, uh, that we call the, the heart wall, where when we feel like our heart is going to break, uh, the subconscious mind will put up a wall around that heart because the heart really, we believe, is the is the um, the same as what the ancients believed it to be. It's the source of love and creativity and romance, and it's really the core of our being. And the, I believe it's the seed of the soul. And so when you're feeling deeply hurt or deeply abused or grieved, you can feel that physical sensation that most of us have felt, right? Like our heart's going to break. Mm. And that's very uncomfortable. And so that wall will go up. And then that, uh, that really handicaps us from really being able to manifest the best creative ideas that we have because those best creative ideas are in our heart. And uh, so when you remove that wall around your heart, which I think is the most important, people, uh, the most important thing people can do uh, with the emotion code is to get rid of that heart wall. Uh, because people often when that wall is taken down, people's lives change. Mm. They uh, they report things like their um, uh, well people sometimes fall in love that never ever thought they would uh, sometimes people have creative ideas that just start to flow spontaneously and uh, yeah it's it's uh, the most important part really of the emotion code is is uh, is that whole topic the heart wall which is a whole another <laughs> topic you know it's we could easily do an hour another hour on that but it's all in the emotion code book. Well, you said something like 80% of people have a heart wall. We think it's closer to 93%. Wow. Actually. So if you're listening, there's a good chance you have a heart wall and you probably, yeah. it's in your best interest to work on clearing it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, if you're, uh, if you're finding it difficult to, to find love or stay in love, um, if you want to have better relationships, if you want to be able to create more abundance in your life and really manifest better creativity, uh, your heart is really a second brain. It's amazing, you know, uh, when they started doing heart transplants, uh, it didn't take long before people would start coming back. They would come back and they'd say that they had new memories of places that they'd never in their lives visited. Now, I've never been to Rome, but I've got memories of being there. <laughs> I mean, how weird would that be after a heart transplant? Or they would say, uh, you know, my handwriting has totally changed. Or... <laughs> Uh, my taste in music or food or sports totally changed. And in every case, there are whole books written about this, right, Caitlin? But in every case, when people were taken back and connected to the family of the heart donor, they would find out, oh, my gosh, yes, that's our son's handwriting that you have. Or, well, yes, our daughter played baseball. That must be why you love baseball now. Or, well, you know, our son visited Rome every year. That must be why you have, you have his memories of being in Rome. You've never in your life visited. I mean, things like that. It's crazy, right? But the heart is a brain. And uh, it's full of gray matter and white matter. They didn't even discover that until the 1970s. And there are whole books written about this, about these weird transplant experiences, right? There's something really special about the heart. And civilizations have known about the heart and its importance for, since time out of mind. I mean, think about it, even today. Um, if you receive uh, on Valentine's Day some chocolates, it'll probably be in a little heart-shaped box, right? Why? Because it's all about romance, and the heart truly is about romance. It's the brain that runs your romantic life. And uh, some of the studies that have, done, uh, have been done are really amazing. For example, they found that when one person's feeling love or affection for another person, 
the heartbeat will become measurable in the other person's brain waves. Think about that. There's a communication going on between us, you see, that's invisible. So we, we might discount it or think it's not there, but it's definitely there. So, um, so if you're trying to find your soulmate, this is where you ha absolutely have got to go. You've got mm -hmm. to go here. And if you've already found your soulmate, but you want to stay with your soulmate, well, you want to go here as well, because that heart wall will interfere with your ability to give and receive love. And it's the most important part of this work that we can do. See, so. Well, a lot of my friends, I'm in my 30s, a lot of my friends are in their 30s. Some of them are in happy relationships. Some are still looking for love. So yeah. I'm going to tell them all that they need to check and see if they have a heart wall and clear that. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, and then just have them send you, send you the results. I mean, we see so many, so many amazing things. Um, oh gosh, let's see here. Uh, let me just share one of these with you. Oh, here's a fun one. Listen to this one. <laughs> um, we have so many of these stories. We get, we have thousands of these stories. Uh, this person, her name is Alina. Uh, from Romania, actually. She said, I discovered the emotion code almost three months ago. The first time when I used the emotion code, I discovered a heart wall and a trapped emotion of grief. I immediately knew what it was all about. Seven years ago, I met someone who I really liked. He and I didn't date, but were platonic friends. He lost his wife a few months before that and was still grieving. I picked up his trapped emotion of grief when I visited him in London. Mm -hmm. After each of us had our heart walls cleared, we got in contact with each other and we are now dating. Since then, I have cleared out more trapped emotions. So uh, thanks for bringing hope back into my life. So, uh, yeah. so you know, there's lots of fun stories like this. We've, we have thousands of these. I don't know how many. Thousands. <laughs> I can tell you we have, just for fun, 7,551 stories like that. Wow. And that's specifically <laughs> heart wall stories? No, there's all kinds of stories about the heart wall. These are just about, that's about everything. Um, We've got uh, 3,672 stories like that are about the heart wall. Wow. Um, we've got uh, 7,200 are about, you know, um, the, the emotion code. Anyway, there's lots of these, and you can yeah. find these on, a lot of these on our website at discoverhealing.com. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I'm getting a link to your social media and your website and your courses in the notes on, to this show. Okay. Well, great. Thank you, Caitlin. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Bradley. I just love talking to you, your energy, the way you speak. Um, I can't wait to see you at one of the seminars. And I think I am going to do some of your healing, learning how to become a healer courses. Yeah, well, that's awesome. Well, we'll, we'll welcome you. The world needs you and lots, lots more people like you that, um, that come from a place of love and that, uh, that want to help heal the world by healing uh, friends and loved ones and clients and, and so on. It's time. You're right. <laughs> well, thank you for making time for me today. And I know you have seven children and a wife and a business. So I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you so much. It's been really fun to be on with you. And uh, <laughs> I want to thank all of your listeners for listening as well. So re remember, you can go to emotioncodegift.com and download the first couple of chapters of the book and the chart on emotions and the flow charts. And you can get the book on audible.com uh, as an audio. You can also get it, uh, of course, Amazon and, and all the bookstores. Mm -hmm. I'll uh, link to it on Amazon as well. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Dr. Bradley. Okay. Have a great day. Thank you. Enjoy your days just starting. Enjoy the rest of your day. Yep. Oh, yeah. That's evening for you. We'll have a great evening. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bye. Don't forget to check out his website, discoverhealing.com, spelled out D I S C L V E R H E A L I N G dot com. Also, don't forget to get your free emotion code gift by going to emotioncodegift.com, spelled out E M O T I O N. C O D E G I F T dot com. And finally, don't forget to check Dr. Bradley out on Facebook under facebook.com slash 
Dr. Bradley Nelson, spelled out D-R-B-R-A-D-L-E-Y-N-E-L-S-O-N or facebook.com slash discoverhealing.